This is sodium chloride that has been blasted with 300 times the lethal dose of radiation and it's got some interesting properties that I want to talk about. The first thing I want to address is safety. So you might assume that something that's been blasted with this much gamma radiation is probably going to become radioactive itself. But actually neutrons are the only kind of radiation that can cause other things to become radioactive. Most types of radiation, alpha, beta, gamma, don't actually cause the things they hit to become radioactive. And that's the difference between the term irradiated and radioactive. This salt is irradiated, but it's not radioactive. The first thing you'll notice about this salt is that it's actually a pale orange colour, but everyone knows that salt, sodium chloride, is white. Unless you're talking about Himalayan pink salt or something, which gets its colour from iron oxide, which is basically rust. So yeah, your fancy Himalayan pink salt is actually full of rust. But that's not the case here. This stuff is actually even purer than the stuff you'll have in your cupboard. And the colour isn't coming from anything added to this orange salt, but actually something's been taken away in a sense. So we're talking about defects or holes forming in the crystal lattice. We'll go into exactly how this happens later, but suffice to say that radiation knocks out individual ions from their position in the crystal. But the way these holes or F centers create the color is a bit less intuitive. Like if I drill a hole through the middle of a crystal, it's not gonna change color, is it? A better way to think of it is in terms of polymorphs, which are things that have the same atomic composition but different structures, like graphite and diamond. They're made, both made out of carbon, but very different colors and textures and all that. If enough F centers are created, they can actually alter the molecular orbitals of the lattice enough that the entire absorption spectrum of the lattice shifts to a peak of blue light around 450 nanometers which means that the salt is absorbing mostly blue light and will appear as its complementary color which is orange in this case the f centers are metastable they can exist for long periods of time even though the electrons are trapped in a higher energy state because the lattice keeps the displaced chloride ions locked in place because in solids ions aren't free to move as they are in liquids and gases. By heating it up we can supply some more energy to the lattice allowing them to vibrate and these displaced chlorine ions can snap back into place. This frees the electrons trapped in the middle of the F center and allows them to relax back to their ground state. I'm sure some people are going to wonder if this salt is edible and what it tastes like and the answer is yeah it's perfectly safe to eat Gamma radiation, like I said, doesn't actually make this radioactive and it's actually used to sterilize hospital equipment, food for long preservation, that sort of thing. But on the package, they don't recommend it because you don't know where the source of sodium chloride came from or what things it came into contact with when it was wherever it was in this nuclear facility. But I can confirm, yeah, it just tastes like regular salt. We can prove that the orange color is entirely due to the F centers rather than any impurity with some simple experiments. First, if we crush the crystal, they become white rather than orange. Um, but to be fair, that can happen when you crush up colored crystals because the smaller grains scatter light so it can appear lighter or white. But also we can dissolve some of the crystals in some water and you'll see there's no trace of the orange color. But again, sometimes colored crystals don't create the same colored solution. But if we evaporate all the water, then we are left with this clear white sodium chloride crystal. Of course, I've kept the best demonstration till last. If you heat the salt on a hot plate around 200 degrees, you can watch as it transforms back into the pure white form right before your eyes. It's a very surreal visual effect because normally things have to melt or change state or react to change color in this way. And if we repeat the experiment in a dark room, you can actually see that as the orange color leaves, the salt actually emits an orange light as well. And this is really cool. And if you sprinkle the salt onto the whole plate, you get this really nice sparkling effect, which looks better in person when your eyes have adjusted to the light, but it still looks pretty cool on camera. It's interesting that the glow is orange as well. It might seem a given that the orange color is given out as orange light, but absorption and emission of light are two separate phenomena, and they're often not the same color. For example, just because some ink appears blue doesn't mean when you heat it up it's gonna give out blue light 
but in this case I don't think it's a coincidence that the sodium emission spectrum has two strong bands in the orange region aka the flame test for sodium salts is orange which doesn't actually look like much because flames are normally orange but trust me it's orange and I also found out that if you irradiate potassium chloride you get a purple solid and it gives out a lilac glow when heated and it turns out that potassium has a flame test color of lilac so it makes sense that it's probably a related effect and this process demonstrates an interesting sequence of energy transfer what we have is a way to harvest energy from strong ionizing radiation store it indefinitely in a solid state and release it on command as visible light Surprisingly, you don't need some futuristic smart material, just common table salt. And it even has a built-in colour indicator to let you know when it's charged. And it's rechargeable an infinite amount of times. So what we have here could be described, if you want to go sci-fi, as a solid-state nuclear battery. A very, very small and inefficient one, of course. It's not going to be useful for any energy storage solutions. The effect is far too small. But it is interesting, especially the storage and release of the energy. Because most nuclear batteries use the heat generated by radioactive material to create a continuous supply of electricity. These are called radiothermal batteries and they're used in say the Voyager probe, things like that in space where there's a high thermal coefficient between the outside and the lump of nuclear material inside. I talked about them more in my nuclear powered calculator video. The ability to store energy as defects in the crystal lattice is what makes this irradiated salt interesting and of course the salt has to be heated up to release the energy, which uses more energy than it releases. So maybe battery is the wrong way of thinking about it. It's more of a temperature dependent radiation sensor than a battery. And as it turns out, that's exactly what salts like this are used for. Sensors in cheap devices called thermoluminescent dosimeters, which are used to keep track of personal level of radiation exposure for people in at risk areas. Except in these devices, they tend to use other metal halide salts like calcium fluoride and lithium fluoride. But if for no other reason, then they're not water soluble, so they won't melt when it rains, which obviously the sodium chloride does have the issue of. The crystal that exhibits this behavior of releasing light when it's heated is called a thermoluminescent crystal. And a lot of alkali halides actually have this property. These sensors work on the principle that the intensity of light released is proportional to the amount of ionizing radiation that the crystal was exposed to. Making the dosimeters is as simple as sandwiching a disc of the crystal between a plastic casing. The complicated part is building an instrument to read the dosimeters. The device has to be fully enclosed and dark so there's no external light getting in and it has to heat up the crystal enough to release the energy and be able to read the intensity of the light emitted accurately enough to be able to determine the proportionality to what dose of radiation that equates to. It's quite a crude system compared to these digital dosimeters, but it's incredibly cheap and it can be a good fail safe that you could have as well as the more advanced ones. The density of the crystal is relatively similar to human soft tissue, so the dose measurement can actually be used pretty accurately to calculate the absorbed dose that the person wearing it has received. And of course, once it's been red, it's turned white again and reset, ready to be used again. And it turns out minerals changing color due to radiation isn't actually that uncommon. It's a property that's commonly exploited in the jewelry industry to make gemstones look more vibrant and colorful and increase their value. You can turn a clear topaz like this into a dark blue topaz just by radiating it with gamma radiation, although you need quite a lot, so it's not something that regular people can do. Um, Black pearls are very rare in nature, but highly sought after. So people started dyeing pearls, but these dyed pearls produce a matte black finish and didn't penetrate the pearl very well. So it's quite obvious that they're fake, but by gamma irradiating a pearl, it keeps its original luster, the sort of shiny pearl looking nature, but becomes very dark blue or black and it penetrates much deeper into the pearl. So even when you drill into it to put it on a necklace, it's not obvious that it's fake. And this process also happens in nature over millions of years. Crystals that have trace amounts of radioactive elements in them can slowly get irradiated around the areas where the trapped elements are. For example, in this smoky quartz, the smokiness is actually caused by trace radioactive elements inside the crystal. If you can think of anything else that I should do with this irradiated salt, let me know in the comments. Uh, hope you enjoyed. 
Bye.